Good evening. The League of Women Voters of Pocatello welcomes you to our Meet the Candidates Forum, featuring the candidates for Pocatello Chubbuck School District Board of Trustees Zone 2. I am Susan Carter, the moderator of tonight's forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization which seeks to promote active participation of citizens in government. The League neither supports nor opposes candidates for office at any level. Recordings of this event may not be used without the express written approval of the League. No part of a League-sponsored video production may be used in advertising or in any way to promote a candidate. The League will only allow audio, video of this event to be broadcast in its entirety. The format for tonight will be as follows. I will call on each candidate and they will each have two minutes for their introduction. Then they will have one and a half minutes to answer each question, followed by two minutes for their closing statement. Questions were compiled and sent to them by the Pocatello League. We will not be taking questions from the audience this evening and viewers will be muted. Candidates, please mute yourself when you're not answering. We will hear from Clayton Armstrong, followed by Heather Clark, and then Idaho Sierra Law. So the opening in two minutes, please introduce yourself and share with voters what prompted you to run for this position and the experience you bring to this unpaid position. What do you hope to achieve in this position? And we'll start with Clayton Armstrong. Hi. I'm Clayton Armstrong. I am a lifetime resident of Pocatello. My grandparents, parents, myself, all my children, and now my grandchildren live here and have gone to Pocatello schools. So I care deeply about education. I was an educator for 35 years and a coach in District 25, as well as a uh, own a small business here in the community. Um, I think my qualifications definitely are the fact that I am an educator. I graduated from ISU with my bachelor's degree and then went on to get a master's degree in education. And having been in the uh, sector of private business also, I understand budgets and working with clients and customers. The things that prompted me especially were just, I've seen things in our district that I, I think we need to be more listening to parents, community, teachers, and as a past teacher, I know the importance of this. So with my teaching background and business background, I think I have a lot to offer. In addition, my father was a board member for eight years and a respected member of that position and the community. So with my parenting and other skills, I think I have a lot to offer and just wanna give back to the community because I did love being an educator, so. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Clark. Thank you. So as mentioned, my name is Heather Clark and I'm running for zone two. Uh, I am a 20 year, nearly 20 year resident of Pocatello. Uh, I currently serve as the deputy director for life, a center for independent living. And prior to that, I spent 18 years, excuse me, 13 years as um, the executive director and a cellist with the Idaho State Civic Symphony. Uh, now more than ever, I believe we need people on the school board who are concerned with providing children with a good education free from political agendas. I have been very fortunate to be involved with many incredible opportunities for leadership in both my professional career, as well as a community volunteer. I would use those years of experience in management and fiscal oversight to ensure a high degree of integrity and stability is implemented when establishing district spending priorities, approving budgets, drafting bond proposals, and reviewing district expenditures. I believe one of the biggest assets that I bring to this candidacy is that I have the least amount of preconceived agendas, and I'm willing to work in collaboration with my fellow board members, with the school administration, teachers, and parents, and I'm willing to take the time to research, learn, adapt and present in a professional and respectful manner. My vision and priority as a board member is to assure that all students have a place where they feel welcome, safe, recognized, and ultimately a place where they can develop their individual passion for learning. Thank you. Thank you. Idaho Sierra Law. Sorry. Um, basically, I thought I was writing a script. I didn't know I was writing a script earlier, but I'll make it very brief and simple. 
<laughs> especially with people who are residents of this area and should have known for what everything has been published. Just Google image search living with uranium and see how dangerous this city is for our children and residents and how the absence and cover up and those kinds of issues that have continued on here through the years of all boards, it's, it's atrocious what, they, what has happened here. And there's no excuse other than well, I understand people are afraid of change. So saving the children, I'll figure we're messing it up. So let me know when I can speak. You are speaking. It's your okay. turn. Mm -hmm. So saving the children, simply saving our city, our university, our economy, our legacy. The radioactive people we've become as the most radioactive city in the world with a million tons of uranium spread all over this valley. The public data is public. It's done by government. It's done by private. It's been done confirming. It's been done all for years and it's been published and gotten, but people don't seem to be well educated enough to do research, to look, to learn, to read the data, to, to listen to people and look at their data they present. So this is all public. So basically, this is not just an issue of Pocatello. This is an issue of Chubbuck, of course, very radioactive community. There are hundreds of thousands of tons of this material. They just moved City Hall from a uranium deposit site to another site that was deposited uranium materials before. If we can't protect the people, how are we supposed to protect the children? Safety first. I am a project learning expert, okay? I do consulting and have around the world and teaching this around the world. I go Thank into you. places to solve their- Thank you, sir. Um, our next, our first question, um, Kevin Reichert recently wrote in the Idaho Education News, quote, elections reflect the tone of their time. This, school, excuse me, this fall, school board elections are shaping up to be much more politicized than the low profile, low turnout races of the past. As a nonpartisan school district trustee, how will you keep politics out of your decision making? Where will you get your information from to make school board decisions? And how will you ensure voters that you are being open-minded and objective in this process? Again, we'll start with Mr. Armstrong. Thank you. I believe that one of the biggest keys to keeping politics out of uh, the decision-making process is not to be influenced by headline media and mainstream media. I don't think it's the best place to get our information. I think there's a lot of information out there that we can utilize and various sources. One of the things that I uh, will definitely do is a lot of research on my own um, through various uh, technology aspects of things. But I think the real key, especially for our community, is listening to our community, to the parents, to the teachers, to the uh, patrons here in the district because they have the heartbeat of the city. And that's the most important thing to listen to. Also, I will promote task force that consists of parents and teachers for important issues, as well as then giving the um, public plenty of time to, to act on those things, to have time to do their own research, to come to board meetings prepared, not just giving them a five-day uh, issue or five day information time to, to, to discuss major issues. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Clark. Thank you. So if we have learned anything from the pandemic it is that we can't just go back to the way things were before. The education literature brims with ideas of how we can use what we've learned during the pandemic and move on to changing the education paradigm for the better with more deep learning, more opportunities for creativity, going beyond just teaching to mandated tests. We have to move beyond the factory model of just processing our kids. In addition, we have to convey to children that they are, there are many more options available to them than just going to college, joining the military or flipping burgers. 
There are tremendous opportunities out there and with the assistance of our excellent educators, meaningful family engagement, individualized guidance counseling, transparent and responsible resource utilization and community support, we have the ability to foster highly educated, well-rounded, healthy young adults properly equipped to lead a successful future. Thank you. Idaho Sierra. Nicely said, but I don't know how you're gonna make healthy children in the most radioactive city in the world. That is an impossibility. So first of all, again, saving lives is not a political agenda. Science is not political and should not be used in that matter. And I hope that Mr. Kevin Reichert is not related to Bruce Reichert, who actually blocked me running for the, on the Idaho reports, running for Congress. So people don't, don't want to, you know, allow people to learn the issues. So I am concerned about who is doing what and why. So we hope this new re reflection that we people have here is deals with the heinous crimes of criminal child abuse, criminal child endangerment, criminal child neglect, and felony risk prison. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll help arrest any of them for that. We have been doing that. We have been educating the world and legal firms and everything. This child needs to stop infecting and killing children and adults in this community. Make it a healthy place to live. And this has been going on for 70 years and it still hasn't dealt with it. I am sorry that it came under the secrecy of the Manhattan Project in 1938 and 1942, but that's still no excuse. Thank you. Um, schools play a critical role in supporting the welfare of each student, not just their academic achievement. What will you do to protect the health, safety, and well being of students, teachers, school staff, their families, and our communities? How will you ensure that best practices are implemented to keep our schools open and our communities safe? And how will you incorporate advice from professionals? Clayton Armstrong? Again, I believe that um, we have to let the community's voice um, be heard and let their concerns be met um, in all aspects of safe schools and in keeping our schools open. Um, one of the things that I definitely think we need to do is include our local and regional medical professionals, especially doctors, the doctors who are seeing the kids, who are seeing parents, teachers, um, to keep us updated on the evidence and um, on the data that affects our community and our schools here. Um, we should dive deeper into the subjects while ignoring a lot of the shallow mainstream media headlines that are out there. The mental health of the students is a number one priority. Um, and you can't have good physical health if you don't have good mental health. And when, and, and when you shut down the physical side, you're also shutting down the mental side. So I know that being in schools full time and having masks optional is something that our community wants and it's in, it's in line with good mental health. Students do not get affected nearly as much by the COVID problem as adults and especially with people with heavier conditions. And, and I think that we can meet those um, by keeping kids in school as well as monitor closely with some of the technology we have. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Clark. So we now have ample data collected by our public health officials and the scientific community to know that the best way to keep our kids safe from the, we know how to keep our kids safe from this pandemic. This is not a political issue. It is a public health issue and keeping people safe is a primary responsibility of our government and of our schools. We don't blow secondhand smoke in people's faces. We obey the speed limit. We wear seat belts, all on the advice of public experts. Our own good sense and our responsibility to our community. Managing this pandemic in the schools is no different. I think this pandemic has brought to light and perhaps even elevated a perceived disconnect between those making the decisions and those most impacted by the decisions. We've seen confusion over protocols and roadmaps, and we've seen parents show up to speak at meetings passionate and frustrated. I believe an opportunity 
opportunity now exists for the board to review what has worked in the past and to be proactive moving forward. If the goal is to keep our kids in the classroom and maintain consistency and retain our teachers and staff, then the stabilization of the school environment with routines and predictability will have the best success for positive outcomes. We need continued opportunities for input from parents to work as a team to improve student and family engagement to support our students most affected by the shutdown. Thank you. Thank you. Idaho Sierra. Hello. Yeah, basically, I'm focused on the simple thing that I know people here don't know anything about Lud's disease, heavy metal toxic poisoning and what it does, and that nobody ever tests for it. And the behavior in those who survived as FOSS babies, which is basically cancer mutants. This is an area of the FOSS babies, named by the people in this region. Okay, so the children, our children, hey, and how we treat them is our future. And look what we have done, totally ignoring the health and safety in a community where school boards have for 45 years knowingly, as I said, felony misprison, contaminated our children, citizens year after year to the extent that deadly cancer-causing uranium materials fill the sandboxes in our schools. That's what we had done in this town. And that is a legacy you will not get away from. And you continue because it's still on the schools. That's the atrocity the world is waiting to find out what happens here. You allowing these schools to not be cleaned up in this community. Period. And that's what it's about. Safety first. The world knows they are not happy. Just Image, Google image, search four words, living with uranium Pocatello and start learning something. Okay, the facts are there. Radioactive city data systems will show this whole valley where the uranium is done by the US government, need G and G and confirmed and hid from us for 40 years, but not anymore. Things are changing, are you going to? I wear a mask, not because of COVID, I wear a mask because in the dry area in this community, we are, their children breathe the uranium dust constantly. Thank you. The Idaho legislature has been unable to develop a new K through 12 funding formula. This unresolved issue means our school district must continually pass supplemental levy levies to maintain operations. What can you do as a trustee to ensure our school district is adequately funded? What would you do to inform the public as to the necessity of investing in our youth? And do you have any other ideas for funding and fiscal responsibility? Clayton Armstrong? First of all, yeah, the legislature needs to be attacked pretty hard. Uh, you, years ago, schools were funded through property tax. Senator Risch and Governor Otter changed that to sales tax. So when your economy goes down, your sales tax goes down, and so does funding for school. We need that to get changed back to property taxes because, and, and that's something, you know, that we can't really do as a board, but we can put that pressure out there to happen. But um, because, I, because I believe that it, it's hard to ask for levies consistently. But one of the things that I would do so that the public sees is I would publish our budget on the district's website to show exactly the money that's coming in where it's spent, how it's used, what reserves are there, so that everybody can see that, that if there's a deficit, if we need building expansion, if we need repairs, if we need funding for something else, the, the, the parents, everybody can go to that website, they can see the budget, they can understand the concern that there's transparency in the spending. The other thing that I would definitely do is I would reach out to donors, to alumni, to private business with donations and sponsorships especially helping with the extracurricular to be able to help fund and take the burden off of uh, so that more of the money can be used for schooling, but we keep our sports programs and we actually improve them through donors, through private business, through um, people that want to contribute. I think there's untapped resources to do this. Thank, Thank you. you. Heather Clark. Thank you. So one of the responsibilities of a school board member is to be an advocate, advocate for public education. And this means making sure our state legislators know what the needs of the public schools are. It also means standing up and defending our public schools. These schools are the bedrock of our communities. 
The notion that we can neglect the public schools or rely on alternative schools or alternative fundings is to do the work of providing universal educate, public education is a flawed notion. It has never been proven successful. Legislatures need to be reminded of this. We must advocate as individuals, but also as an organization that is committed to the cause of universal public education. In short, money matters. Resources that cost money matter and a more equitable distribution of school funding can improve those outcomes. The choice we make on how to fund and allocate funding uh, requires high quality research to help guide the critical choices this board will need to make regarding school finance. Um, given this notion, it is, important, it is apparent that there's enough work for all of us to, be, to do in order to prove our student success for everyone to help carry a small part of that load. Thank you. Idaho Sierra. Well, I'll guarantee that none of you in that room attended the hearings here by the EPA regarding the contaminations of our valley. I'll guarantee that none of you have even read anything from it. But I asked them for billions of dollars for cleanup and they said any amount. Simple as that, and you don't take it. So we, some of us don't have any concern what you wanna do for your legacy and your reputation in this whole country. You hurt this country. And I mean, everybody here that is involved in this cover up does a hurt this country. They contaminate the food, it's in the foods, you know, put there from our industry here. We contaminate the whole Eastern. I'm the one who solved the problem about cancer and cigarettes for the big tobacco companies that it was the uranium in the tobacco that got there from their fertilizer. And then they cut all their contracts here in Pocatello, Idaho, all of them, millions of dollars. And then the Saudis and the Kuwaitis found out and they pulled all their children out of here. So when are we gonna wake up and also deal with this situation here? It's your legacy and it's falling quickly because the technology is there. And if you don't do anything, the outside world will they'll shut you off. Thank you. Um, the Idaho School Board Association supports Idaho's current content standards as approved by the Idaho State Board of Education. Yet there have been attempts by the legislature to revise, repeal, or even delay the adoption of the standards. Our school districts has invested significant resources for time and money in the professional development and curricular materials aligned to these standards. What are your views about the standards as written? Are there any changes that you would like to see implemented? And if so, what are they? Clayton Armstrong? I have never been a real proponent of the common core expectations and the ISAT testing that the district switched two years ago. We started with the SRA testing that ran for so long and was really a valid testing system and only took a couple of days to administer. Um, and we had really good data because it compared us statewide with everybody else on the same test. The ISATs are very, very uh, broad and different questions from year to year. And so you didn't have a validity in that testing and you can't change that. I, I would propose that we go back to something like the SRA that we go to more basic performance-based tests that are tied directly to the curriculum that we're using. And these could be done two or three times a year and, and take a day to two, uh, a day each time um, so that we can look at those major disciplines that we're going over. I think there's a lot more that can be said about this, but you know, we test our students at the end of their, their public schooling on the um, ACT and the SAT. And that's how they get into colleges. And those are much very different than the ISATs. And so we need to be looking at that. If those, those have been around for so long, we need to look at those and utilize that type of testing. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Clark? Sure, so standards, uh, the standards are not specific tests. It's not a set curriculum. It's not a specific textbook. 
They were intended to divine, excuse me, define a level of skill that a student should have at any specific given grade level. It also was not a mandate from the federal government, but each state was allowed to choose to opt in or opt out, and Idaho chose to opt into these standards. I support these standards to the extent that they provide students with learning that is fact-based and science-based. Students should learn what can be supported by science and objective accounts of historical events. Political agendas and ideologies intended to indoctrinate students have no place in the classroom. Students should know about the significant thought movements that have influenced the course of societies around the world, but they should not be indoctrinated into them. Teachers know best about what works in the classroom. That is why these standards establish what students need to learn, but they don't dictate how teachers should teach them. Instead, it will be up to the schools and the teachers who will best decide how to help these students reach the standards. Thank you. Thank you. Idaho Sierra? Well, let me say this. I'll tell you who I am. I am basically, my name is Idaho Law. You're going to live with it, deal with it. I'm a publisher. I'm an investigative reporter, a multidiscipline educator and scientist, project learning expert, nuclear health physics scientist, writer, videography, consultant to corporate government and non-corporate agencies in cities, states, and governments, and local, state, and international. Also, as an active environmentalist, experienced out stateside as well as abroad, interacting with an array of topics. Project learning which are so resistant to utilize well is what people demand, want, and what people call me in to either teach them how or to do it. Project learning. We have a big project here called cleaning up Pocatello. Safety first, but that's what the College of Technology, if we're going to save the university, needs as well. Because again, we are in the most radioactive city in the world. Data proven. So deal with it. That's what causes cancer. There's a lot of things to learn. Self-motivation, student-centered, the things that project learning strengthens in the child, in a person, in anything. Every job you do should be somehow that you're learning from it as a project, not just regurgitating your own information or your own schooling. You've got to evolve yourself. Cores change. And they change because they need Thank you. to. Thank you. Many students are not suited for four-year academic degree, but do well in a career technical field with high paying jobs. Some districts have career technical education or CTE high schools with dual, pro, dual credit programs in fields such as medical assisting and healthcare, automotive, robotics, cybersecurity, and energy systems. These programs shorten the time a student needs to spend at a higher ed facility before entering the work workforce. Excuse me. Uh, school district number 25 needs more career technical capacity and modernization to train people to fill local jobs. If you agree, how could this be funded? Great Clayton question. Armstrong? Sorry. Hi. I love this question. Many students are not suited to a four year college degree and many graduate with one and don't know what to do with it. Um, I'm a huge proponent of creating more classes in career education so that students can explore different, explore different fields and find their passions. Much of our society is run by the trades, construction, mechanics, electricians, medical assistants, et cetera, and many are good paying jobs. Exploratory classes um, could be offered in various fields and then partnered with local businesses to have work study programs to get involved. I don't think this is a huge expense to be able to do this. I think that local businesses would jump at the opportunity if they knew that they could take on internships with, with young kids and, and, and high school kids that they could then hire as possible employees. I have hired dozens and dozens and dozens of my ex-students and athletes that have worked in my business and put themselves through college, two or three of them starting their own businesses just like mine. And so I know this is a, an awesome opportunity, one that I would greatly want to look into and reach out to the community to help out with. Thanks. Thank you. Heather Clark? 
Thank you. I also strongly support the promotion of these CTA trainings for any student who wishes to pursue this track. I also support programming that would help make students aware of these career opportunities. I would certainly favor spending in this area rather than spending to support alternative schools that essentially duplicate what the public schools are doing. I would also support programs that foster relationships between employers and the schools in order to develop internship and apprenticeship opportunities. We should also continue to facilitate students' acquisition of these certifications, many of which we know can and are being earned in classes that are currently part of their regular curriculum. Finally, I believe state legislators have a responsibility to provide the funding that is necessary to create these CTE, CTE programs, and by not, no, not doing so, they are not meeting their responsibility to provide students with that comprehensive, adequate education. Thank you. Thank you. Idaho Sierra Law? Well, I'm glad we're on the same page about technical learning and the overemphasis we put on academia because it's nothing like philosophers talking about how we're going to save the world and then do little about it. It's the people who do the work. It is. So technical education, I've always supported that at all levels. My focus, even with Idaho State University and trying to save it, is the state is the robotic and technical college. They have a nice new building up on the hill, but they are in the same boat you are. You're in them, they're both, both of these are in the middle of the most radioactive city in the world. Again, it's your legacy. Either you apply it, learn how to clean it up, deal with it, make it part of curriculum like other communities in this country have asked me to help on when they got an environmental issue that's affecting their economy, their community, their jobs, their health, all of that, yes. Integrated project learning, it's a simple really thing to do. It just takes a teacher who knows how to work in the standards to make sure they're covered with each individual's self-motivation to learn because it's something they care about. And in this case, it's their lives. The monster is in the room. The monster is in Pocatello. And you can ignore it, you can sweet talk it, you can talk it like it's really nice, but it isn't going away, it's just coming down. So be ready for it, or it's your, you know, your legacy will go down the hill, the fallen legacy of Idaho. So we Thank hope you. you'll change what you do. Thank you. Teachers and school district staff are facing unprecedented, stressful circumstances during a pandemic. Pressures include student loss of learning, lacking parent um, support, low pay, and understaffing. Under this pressure, teachers must prepare students to meet statewide academic standards. As a board trustee, what changes can be made in school district number 25 to empower educators? How would you foster a positive, supportive work environment for school district staff? And how can you nurture the relationship between the school district staff, families, and the community? Clayton Arstra? The board was recently discussing what to do with the large amount of COVID relief money that they have. And I, I definitely believe that some of this needs to go to the teachers and the staffs for all the extra work that they've had to do. If, if, teacher get, if teachers get sick, especially from COVID, and COVID related, then, then they should not have to use their personal sick leave days for this. The, the district has extra days, extra money to cover this. I think they could also increase the pay for substitutes to entice more substitutes and have training sessions for substitute teachers so that if we do lose teachers to sickness or anything else, we have staff to cover that. Um, also that we have more job seminars and, and to attract people and, and people to go into teaching. And then what we spend overall on students needs to be increased. Um, our district's one of the lowest, what we spend per student. We need to listen to the teachers, hear their concerns and use their knowledge to make improvements when decisions are made and how they are made. And as stated earlier, everyone needs to have a portion of this, the public, the parents, and we need to put out the sensitive issues and the topics that are coming up so that the public has more time to be able to be prepared for that and research their own facts so that they can come prepared to share their ideas with the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Heather Clark. 
What we expect from our professionals today is unrealistic. Teaching is a profession, not a calling. Do we shop around for the cheapest doctor, the cheapest contractor, or do we look for competency? Idaho's teacher salaries are some of the lowest in the nation. Is the education of our children something we want to shortchange? There's a national shortage of good teachers. University education departments are turning out fewer and fewer teachers because fewer and fewer young people wish to enter a profession of such high stress and responsibility, but low compensation. As with any other profession, we get what we pay for. The core challenges facing our teachers are the need for tools, time, and trust. Our teachers need the right tools and resources to do their jobs. They need the time to properly prepare. And most importantly, they need the trust of our students, parents, and school administration. Teachers must have confidence that the administration trusts them to teach their students to the highest standards. An empowered teacher exudes confidence in the classroom, which often parlays into student confidence in the teacher. Empowered teachers inspire students to think freely and with excitement in, of their subject matter. The classroom where students freely discuss and question is a classroom where deep learning takes place. If administrators truly believe that teachers are our most valuable teaching asset, by empowering our teachers, we show that we mean that statement and are willing to trust them to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. Idaho Sierra Law. I'm glad somebody mentioned the COVID relief money. So let's throw some numbers out there. You know, COVID is hurt a lot in this country and it's still going, but it will eventually go away. But the uranium materials has been here for 70 years. And that money is available for cleanup in billions of dollars. And not just a little bit, just like what's been going on in Northern Idaho with that cleanup. It's been going on 40 years, but they've gotten millions of dollars into that economy to help it. You're denying our community and everybody here that does that, you're denying that money's to come. And the, 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 we have, you wanna hear another crazy number? 140 million people died of cancer since this began here in this city, and we are mostly responsible for it from our industries here. FMC, the Chemical Weapons Division, the Uranium Materials, and the Food Pro Radioactive Fertilizer Corporation. We have killed more people than anybody could have ever imagined. And that's why I have saved lots of lives, thousands if not millions of lives, and you need to do something about it or else you'll go down in history as that thing, uh, that monster in the room or the, the state of Idaho because you'll hurt them. But the state will also contribute because they already have been giving exceptional little things to Pocatello, Idaho because to keep the uranium issue quiet because they all know but it's about time we collect the dues and clean it up, both federal and state. Thank you. Um, we'll go into our closings now, and we will allow each candidate to have two minutes for a closing statement. Clayton Armstrong. Well, I'm far from perfect. Um, I am a person of sound moral character and honesty and integrity. I strive daily to live by the golden rule that, you know, my parents taught me you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I, I, uh, I live by that. I've raised my children to live by that and tried to teach my students and athletes to live by that and always give their best. I'm not one who likes mediocrity. If I see a problem or an unacceptable situation, I don't want to just sit and complain, but I've taught them to go out and do something about it. And I believe that's what I'm trying to do now. In addition to this, I believe that we should show respect to others and to their opinions, even when we disagree. I do not accept, I do accept that others will not always agree with me, but I want them to know they're heard and they're listened to. And that if a decision, when we bring in the public to give public comment on a particular issue, if there's only overwhelmingly against maybe what I had thought or we had thought, then we can table that issue and do more investigation to be able to make sure we are in line with what the community wants here. But we, we, we have to be willing to sometimes agree to disagree because that's always gonna happen in the society in which we live in. But we can do that respectfully and we can do that honestly. And so I, I thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Heather Clark. Thank you. 
As we've seen recently, there has been a lot of politics and inflammatory rhetoric. It's absolutely critical that we work to build better relationships between all the parties involved to more easily and more peacefully find the best solutions for all our children and to regain and maintain the public trust. I think this starts with board representatives being accessible to the people they represent. I'd like to see us get back to basics, focusing on continued promotion of evidence-based decision-making, improved financial transparency, and ensuring our parents and teachers are engaged and have a seat at the table. In order to accomplish this, we need board members that are effective in understanding what is and is not their role. If the mission of the board is to provide an educational experience that challenges their learners to achieve their highest potential, then we need to elect members that understand and adhere to these responsibilities themselves. An effective board member is one that knows how to work as a team, willing to collaborate, treats others with respect and courtesy, focuses on student achievement and avoids pushing forward personal or political agendas. A board member needs to be a consistently good communicator, providing transparent, honest, and proactive communication to help avoid confusion and contention, while creating efficiencies and avenues to engage in positive ways, willing to share timely their actions with the community willing to advocate for the schools, acknowledging and promoting the successes and achievements of staff and students and building trusting relationships through the community. A board member needs to understand their responsibility to support and embrace the vision of the school and to do their part to help achieve the district goals academically, fiscally, phys physically, and emotionally. Ultimately, our school board must be proactive in promoting a positive culture that is welcoming and focused on providing a strong public education as the foundation for our community's future success, rather than the distraction of divisive politics. Let's move past these distractions, channel our passions in a constructive direction, and explore our district's needs, research viable options, consider the evidence, implement policy, and make it happen for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Idaho Sierra Law. Well, as I said before, you've got a problem here. The monster's in the room. There's no one who has dedicated more to students in this community than all the years when I have been here, always working with the school districts, always dealing with education wherever I am. But you've run out of time. I'm running for U.S. Senate. I have connections all over the country. And we're going to help this community above the agencies that have been corrupted by the politicians in this state. This is not a political thing of safety first. It's not a political thing like uranium and our health and the children's well-being and Lud's disease and FOSS babies. They are not a political issue. They are life-threatening. The first bit of our Constitution is not guns. It's not even liberty. It's life. L-I-F-E. Please look it up because we need to change our paradigm here. And that's what I work with, paradigm shifts. So what we have here is a, something that has to stop being diverted and controlled by the paradigm, by the those who want to control the narrative, like the Idaho State Journal, owned by the Adams family, owns most of the papers here. I um, reach out to people like Eastern Idaho News that told, tell it like it is because everybody in Eastern Idaho has been affected by this stuff and all the schools have. That uranium, million tons were put in from Rexburg all the way down to Blackfoot at the Teton flood in 1976 reclamation project. Deal with it, okay? Everybody has this problem, not just Pocatello, but we are number one in the world, the most radioactive in the world. And it doesn't go away because the life of these things is only removed by removing it. It is not going to decay. It's not going to fade away like COVID. It has to be removed like cancer, taken Thank out. Thank you. Um, that ends our questions for this evening. Recordings of tonight's forum will be available for on-demand viewing. And links will be posted on the League's website at lwvid.org. League is always open to new members of all genders. Membership information can also be found on the website. Remember to vote on November 2nd. Early voting at the Bannock County Elections Office started and ends uh, this Friday, October 29th. For more information, visit vote411.org the league's go-to election site, or the Bannock County Elections Office at bannockcounty.us backslash elections backslash. The Pocatello League is grateful to the candidates and the league members who made this forum possible. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs>